Dear friends, we will obtain a deeper view of the total human being if we go a little further into the matters we were considering yesterday. In particular, we should see from such symptoms how important the transition is from health to illness. I would like, therefore, to speak further about something that lies between certain pathological trends that are developing in human evolution and a kind of natural initiation that constitutes another stream in human evolution. It is a phenomenon that lies in the middle between the pathological tendencies of human nature and the stream of initiation. It relates as much to one as to the other. Typical of such a path of development are such personalities as the one I spoke of yesterday, St. Teresa. One can observe much more than I described if one makes a study of some of these individuals. With them there is a kind of appearance of the spiritual world at the threshold of perception. Parenthesis, naturally, this is difficult to describe because the words one has to use to characterize these abnormal conditions do not have such meanings in our everyday speech, but I think you will understand. Close parenthesis. What appears at the threshold of perception is the first stage for such persons and is called by them, quote, entrance into the first dwelling place of God, close quote. In the first stage, this is perceived only as a presence. These persons experience the presence of some spiritual being, but they have no precise vision of the being. If the experience comes to a definite conclusion, <clears throat> they have a clear feeling that the being was there with them, that is the first experience, an indefinite experience of a presence, a being together with some spiritual being. And as long as the persons are in this stage of their development, they are even annoyed when someone else tells them of his visions, because they think their own experience is much more inward, much more intimate, more genuine. This has been such a moving experience for them that they have the feeling Human beings are not allowed to see the supersensible world, but I have been given this vague experience of its reality. But then these persons reach a second stage, and they tell of actual shaped perceptions of the spiritual beings who were present. First, they tell of the feeling of being touched, of having spiritual hands laid upon them, even of their forehead being touched, or something similar without yet having any visual experience. Then the condition is raised to vision that is like optical perception. It can be so enhanced that a person sees Jesus, for instance, standing before him as a real person. That is the usual second stage. It is a peculiar fact that persons advancing from the first to the second stage have only the vaguest feeling that earlier they had become angry when someone told them of his own experiences in this second stage. Memory does not clearly connect the two stages. The persons live very intensely in the respective single stages. The third stage that they experience is remarkable. Their description of it is highly colored in every detail. They tell how, when it comes upon them, they are seized by tremendous pain. And indeed it is obviously intense, for at these moments they can be heard groaning. Other reactions can be observed such as occur with pain originating in the physical and etheric bodies. But the strange thing is that the persons want this pain. They want it because they regard it as natural that they should have it. They feel that they will only reach the subsequent experience properly if, first, they suffer this pain. Then they reach the stage where, within themselves, they transform the pain. And this is extraordinarily interesting, for actually the pain remains exactly the same, but now it is enhanced to a feeling of joy, of bliss. The experience is like this. The pain comes its objective condition is still there. But now the spiritual awareness goes further. 
If one were suddenly to pull the person out of his spiritual state, the person would feel the pain as a sick person feels pain. And indeed the person does so when he returns from this highest stage of the experience. At this highest stage he no longer has the feeling that spiritual beings come to him, but that he himself has risen into the spiritual world. At this stage the pain is transformed. One might say subjectively, but the expression is not quite exact. The pain is transformed into a feeling of bliss. Then begins a symbolic objectifying of the pain. When the person comes out of this experience and has the memory of it, parenthesis, and in most cases there is a very clear memory of it afterward, close parenthesis, then he describes how a seraphim or a cherubim stood beside him and had a sword that he plunged into the person's intestines which caused excruciating pain. How, when the spiritual being pulled out the sword, he immediately he pulled out the in, excuse me read that again. How, when the spiritual being pulled out the sword, he pulled the intestines out too. How then there came immediately an experience of profound bliss in the presence of God. As a rule, there are three, there are these three stages in succession. We can understand them clearly through our anthroposophical knowledge. You can see that after the preparatory condition, which I described yesterday, the first stage consists of the ego organization drawing the astral body to itself, so that they are united without penetrating the physical and etheric bodies as deeply as they would normally do. Something, therefore, that can never happen in ordinary consciousness is happening for such persons. In half-waking or quarter-waking or three-quarters waking condition, they have conscious experience in their ego organization and astral body, while at the same time experience in their etheric and physical bodies continues with a certain independence. Thus parallel experiences are there, a spiritual experience in the ego organization and astral body, and at the same time a separate experience of the etheric and physical bodies. This is never the case in normal consciousness. There, all four members of the human being are bound closely together. In normal consciousness there is no such thing as experiences of consciousness running parallel. In this experience I am describing, the person feels himself, knows himself in the most eminent sense to be entirely united with what he is experiencing. He knows this first of all, the inherent being one with the happening. When the astral body is drawn to the ego organization and experiences spiritual beings, the person experiences them as simply a presence, as something that is there. He experiences this as one experiences one's own body. One does not differentiate in the latter experience. One does not feel one's body as something standing outside of one. One feels it as part of oneself. That is the first stage, the experience of a presence. Now let us go to the second stage. First the person has all kinds of feelings of being touched. Naturally these can be confused very easily by ordinary pathology with familiar psychiatric symptoms, but they are not the same. Then they advance to actual visions. This is the stage where the ego organization and astral organization draw the etheric body out to be united with them. So again there is a parallel experience. The ego organization, astral organization and etheric body are all three together raised somewhat out of the physical body and at the same time the physical body carries on its processes separately. Something special comes about through this situation. In ordinary life when we see we are stimulated by light from without and we receive the stimulus into ourselves. It goes as far as the etheric body 
and the etheric body creates the conscious experience. That is how it is, for example, with the eyes. When you see, the external stimulation occurs first in the ego, then it penetrates the astral body and penetrates the etheric body. It is then the etheric body that communicates the whole conscious experience to you by pushing in every direction, in a certain sense, against the physical organization. The conscious experience lies in this pushing. That is the exact process. If presented in a diagram, it would look like this. There's a diagram. A stimulus is exerted. First it affects the ego. Then it goes to the astral body, then to the etheric body. In the etheric body it pushes into the physical body in every direction, to all sides. The physical body pushes back, and the pushing back, the repulsion by the physical body, is your actual I, E-Y-E, experience. It is a constant play between the etheric body and the choroid and retina. What the etheric body does in the choroid and in the retina is what it appears to ordinary consciousness as optical experience. This happens similarly with every other sense perception. To anyone who understands these things, the entire explanation in today's psychology textbooks or even in the theories of knowledge is terribly childish. But now, with such persons as I am describing, the etheric body is seized directly in this experience. The experience sits in the ego, astral body, etheric body, and does not push out to the senses, but pushes from within to what is the nerve sense system, pushes first, actually, into the glandular system, then into the nervous system, and finally from there streams into the senses. So the senses are taken hold of in a way that is just the opposite of the way it happens in ordinary life. Instead of the experience of consciousness being stimulated through the senses, it is colored, intensified, made vivid by the fact that it streams from within to the senses. That is how the feeling of being touched comes about in a sensation of the nerves, by the streaming from within outward. This is then raised to vision. Now you know the whole inner process. If there is a further development, it proceeds in the following way. The ego organization, astral body and etheric body take hold of the physical body from quite another direction than would normally be the case. The physical body is accustomed to being taken hold of, ergriffen, from without, but now it is taken hold of from within. Now it is taken hold of in the midst of life, the very process that otherwise only happens when the human soul spiritual entity comes down out of the soul spiritual world into the physical body three weeks after conception. This event cannot otherwise happen in ordinary life, because normally the etheric body is connected with the physical body. But in this case, the etheric body has been raised out by the ego organization and taken hold of by the astral body. It is like birth, when the human being takes possession of his physical body. But now the procedure is more complicated, possessing this physical body from quite another direction, and that causes pain. For as a matter of fact, all pain, in cases of illness too, consists of the fact that the body is grasped hold of from some other direction than the usual one. That is what happens at the moment when the third stage is reached. Now you need not be surprised that this third stage is objectified. It penetrates the physical body, and the physical body repels it. A physical body cannot be so seized except in regular initiation. In any other situation, the physical body exerts opposition, and this causes pain. It pushes away in pain what it is experiencing. That is the first part 
of the experience of the third stage. The physical body exerts resistance and the resistance is experienced as pain. And what enters through the pain? The real spiritual world. It comes through the pain. The spiritual world comes from the other direction. Ordinary sense perception and ordinary thinking grasp hold of the physical world. The spiritual world is grasped in the opposite way. The way to it is through pain. The moment the physical body exerts resistance, intense pain is there. But the moment the pain is taken hold of by the spiritual world, the moment the spiritual world enters, the pain is transformed even to ecstasy. It is really so. First there is pain in the organism, but then the spiritual world penetrates the pain, streams through the pain. A cherubim or seraphim appears. This is what imagination gives the person. The cherubim plunges his sword in, draws it out and draws the intestines out with it. This means that the person becomes independent of his physical body, of his ordinary connection to it. He has no experience in the lower organs. He is led beyond it to an experience of the spiritual world. The physical pain is transformed to bliss. These persons speak of the presence of God if, or if they make distinctions of the presence of the spiritual world. This last stage is experienced by persons who are strong enough in their etheric body to endure the entire happening. They have the foundation for it in their karma. For instance, think of St. Teresa. She had an earlier incarnation in which her soul became especially strong. She incarnates as St. Teresa. But before she incarnates in the physical body, she takes possession of her etheric body very forcefully. And this etheric body becomes inwardly stronger, in quality more vigorous than is the case with the usual human being. She has brought it with her into this life, this etheric body that is inwardly strong. Then this strong etheric body leaves the physical body and unites itself firmly with the astral body and ego, which are themselves also especially strong from an earlier incarnation. And that is the reason why illnesses then appear, at least a certain variety of illness, because the etheric body is not staying in the physical organs and providing them with its nourishing, vitalizing forces. With the persons I am describing, the moment they enter the third stage, they become really ill. But at the same time, their strong etheric body brings it about that in the status nascendi of the illness, they overcome it. The illness appears in status nascendi and immediately an automatic therapy arises within them from the strong etheric body. The entire process is a latent illness and healing. This is one of the most interesting phenomena, phenomena in the realm of human evolution. <clears throat> Precisely in the case of St. Teresa, you see in the final stage of her development a continual status nascendi of illness and the continual cure. This alternation, this wonderful swing of a pendulum between the beginning of illness and the carrying of it, is not a natural happening in the physical world, for it is not brought about in the physical world. It takes place in the spiritual world. We know that the etheric body is formed before the earthly incarnation, and it is into that pre-earthly moment that such a person as St. Teresa returns. When the pathological condition starts, when it is in status nascendi, she swings into the world where she was before birth, into the spiritual world. The pendulum swings between the physical body and the spiritual world. Spiritual world, physical world, spiritual world, physical world. But experiencing the physical world as an exact opposite such as normally a human being only experiences when he is just incarnating into it. This inner process of healing, this therapy coming from the cosmos, is so intense 
that its effect can spread to sick people who are in the neighborhood of such persons if their illness lies somewhat in the same direction. In fact, the most wonderful cures can take place around such persons. Indeed, the influence can extend much further. In the former, better days of the Church, these things were used in a careful, esoteric way. Later this degenerated to a superstitious worship of relics and belief in magic. <clears throat> but it is a fact that in better times of religious evolution, vivid biographies of such persons, including their own imaginative descriptions, were given to the faithful so that they could live through the experiences of such persons in their own imagination. And it could then happen, I won't say it always happened, but it could happen, that when a thoughtful pastor had the opportunity, he would simply put such a biography written so imaginatively into the hands of some individual in ordinary life whose illness was going in a certain direction. Perhaps also he strengthened the effect by his own words. And this was able to start curative processes. Directing the individual's mind to the life of such a saint could have a therapeutic effect. You can see that studies that go so deeply into the human being will always lead over from health to illness, but also into states of supersensible experience. If, therefore, you advise someone, in some connection or other, to do exercises to gain entrance into the supersensible world, the exercises must be so oriented that they strengthen the ego organization, astral body, and etheric body, so that such a path as I described, which was given to an individual simply through her karma, will in fact take its course properly. What takes place in initiation itself can be learned by studying these processes that border so closely on the pathological realm. Therefore, it is not unimportant if a physician takes the time to study the lives of such persons. They will find in them what can only be called a paradox, the healthy counterpart of a complex of pathological symptoms, which he is accustomed to meet here and there in everyday life. And for the physician, that is the most beneficial thing possible, to see the healthy counterpart of a pathological condition. That, more than anything else, will help him to make thoughtful, conscientious decisions about his therapy. If, in addition, he has some knowledge of the substance that can be used as remedy because of its affinity to certain etheric forces, forces that become active automatically in the self-healing of these abnormal persons, then he will know how St. Teresa's etheric body developed its forces when her illnesses appeared in status nascendi. And if he learns to know the healing power to be found in the piercing activity of antimony, then he will have learned the right therapy from nature herself. I would like to point out that in examining such experiences as these, one encounters a remarkable paradox. One sees illness from another side. One sees illness being treated not by man, but by spiritual beings. One kind of treatment is the kind human beings evolve, that is, treatment from the aspect of earth. It consists of restoring the previous condition through some therapy that brings up the illness. The spiritual beings who have to do with humanity treat illness differently. They weave an illness into the fabric of karma. That is their task, indeed a task that doesn't pile things together as they are piled together here on earth by pathology. Here, a seventeen-year-old who is ill is not always cured by the time he is forty-five. But with the way karma is formed, an illness in some incarnation whether it is cured or not, may be woven into the human being's karma three thousand years later. Time is measured quite differently in the spiritual world. But one learns very much from the, those developments in which, from a spiritual point of view, something can happen in the spiritual world and then 
can also stream down into the physical world. Take, for example, such a karma as I have been describing. Perhaps it is completely in the ordinary course of evolution in 3,000 years. Let me show by this line, there's a drawing, that something that happens to a person today is so shaped by spiritual beings that the other part belonging to it, the balance, the compensation, appears in 3,000 years' time. That is the normal course. You see, in ordinary life people don't have a true knowledge of time. How do they think of it ordinarily? As a line running from past infinity through the present into the future. That is approximately how time is imagined. And indeed the time, the line has to be thick, perhaps not even a line, but a thick rope, because it contains everything that is perceived at any given moment in the whole world. That's the way people think of it, if they think of it at all. And most people don't think of it at all. From a spiritual point of view, time is not like that. And one finds little understanding for spiritual developments, which, after all, are present in all physical evolution, when time is thought of in that conventional way. In reality, time is different. The line that I drew there on the board can be all tangled up into a ball. And there's another drawing. The entire line of time is in that ball. Three thousand years are in that ball. Time can be all tangled up. And if it is tangled up for some development or other in evolution, then the tangle can be found in the life of some individual. In the case of St. Teresa, a tangled ball of time was present in her earthly life. We come upon a true mystery that things which in someone's karma would seem to be widely separate for some reason become entangled. You see from such an example how a study of the inner spiritual karmic development must link up with the external pathological and therapeutic inquiry. You can see how the pastoral care of some person by the priest who is basing his view of the person on the karmic connections, the spiritual aspects, can relate to what is seen from a medical view alone. For a comprehension of these things requires not only theoretical knowledge, but really living into the things. The physician must live into them on the pathological, physiological side that opens up for him. The priest must live into them in the theological and karmic views that open up for him. And the harmony will come from their working together out of these two different fields, not from interfering in each other's field in dilettante fashion. This must be stressed again and again. You must still see something else that is connected with these things, particularly in our epoch. You know, dear friends, how distasteful it is to some people to accept a certain idea, the idea of free will, and yet it is perfectly obvious to an unbiased person The philosophers deny its reality because their intellect can't make a connection with it. I said just now, in regard to sense perceptions, that the explanations in physiology and psychology textbooks are to someone who understands these things absolutely childish. But the chatter over free will is far worse. For you must remember, a decision of free will is at every moment an act of the whole human being, the whole human being, no matter how he appears in this impulse, healthy or ill or half ill or abnormally healthy, the whole human being is involved in an impulse of free will, and together with him all that can be known of the whole human being, all the complications. One only learns to know human nature when one learns to know it with all its complications. And please notice, something that in abnormal persons shows too strong a color in one or another direction is neutralized, harmonized in the ordinary human being. There's a trivial expression, but it's true. A cherubim can make friends with you, but the devil can too. And those processes where the devil can squeeze in, we're going to study them too. This is all to be found in the ordinary human being but opposing forces are neutralized because they develop equally strongly in every direction. 
If there's an angel in every human, there's also a devil. But when the angel and the devil are equally strong, they neutralize each other. Now take a look at these scales. There's a drawing. There is one spot, one point, right here. You can lay weights there or there, and then you have put the scales into movement. But this spot always remains still. It has a name, the hypomocleon. It is not affected by what you lay on the scale at the left or what you lay on the scale at the right. Of course, the scales must be built so that this spot will not need to be disturbed. Now, in the human being, a similar, a spiritual hypomocleon is created by the opposing forces. Therefore, you can study human nature, and you will never be able to call man a free being, for by his very nature he is causally conditioned in all respects. <clears throat> if you study the nature of man from the viewpoint of materialism, you do not come to the idea of freedom. You come to causal conditioning. If you study man from a spiritual viewpoint, you come to the determination of the will by God or by spiritual beings. You do not come to free will. You can be a big blockhead of a materialist and deny freedom and do research on the natural causality of the will. Or you can be a sophisticated fellow like Leibniz and gaze out at a spiritual universe and you come to determinism. Naturally, so long as you are considering the scale at this left end of the beam, you have to reckon with movement. So long as you are considering the scale at this right end of the beam, again you have to reckon with movement. And it is the same with man. Whether you consider him from the point of view of nature or from the point of view of spirit, you do not come to freedom. Freedom, dear friends, lies in the middle at the point of balance between them. That's theory, of course. The practice is this. You have to decide when a person comes to you with a difficult life situation whether you can make him responsible for his actions. Now, this becomes a practical question. Whether he can or cannot exercise his free will. How are you going to decide this? You decide by judging whether his spiritual constitution and physical constitution are in balance. And in this the physician and the priest are equally involved. Therefore both physician and priest must be so trained that they possess an understanding of the conditions under which a person is either in balance or not in balance between spirit and nature. Whether an individual has this sense of responsibility can only be decided out of a deep knowledge of human nature. The problem of freedom in connection with responsibility is one of the deepest problems imaginable. Let us continue tomorrow. We will see what from one side leads to health and from the other side leads to pathological conditions.